The Folk on Foot podcast is all about the interaction between landscape and music. And when we heard that there was a group called the Cider House Rebellion who were spontaneously creating music in a North Yorkshire landscape, we thought we had to meet them. The Cider House Rebellion are Adam Summerhays on fiddle and Murray Granger on accordion. And they've particularly singled out a spot in the Valley of Rosedale where an industrial process of extracting ironstone used to take place in the 1800s and you can see the giant stone relics of that process in the landscape and not only have they been responding to that uh, landscape in their music but they've been creating the music in an improvisation on that very spot so we're going to get them to do it again for us and they've invited Adam's daughter Jessie Summerhays to create poetry which complements their spontaneous music it's going to be a voyage of musical discovery into the history of this part of the North Yorkshire Moors I'm so looking forward to it Murray, Adam, Jesse, good morning. Good morning. Fantastic to see you. And what, a, what an amazing place you've brought us to. There's a field of sheep, there's a, a chapel, there's a valley falling away. Um, Adam, where are we? Well, most importantly, actually, just beyond the valley and the sheep, at the top of that hill over there, you can just see a bit of a building. That belongs to the pub that serves the finest old peculiar that I've ever had. Ah, <laughs> this is a great <laughs> opening for the podcast. It's all going really well so far. Other than that, this is um, this is Rosedale. Uh, this bit is Rosedale East, um, and you get up to the head of the dale up there. And just at the top of this incline that we're on, you get to the start of um, a railway uh, that goes all the way around the valley and over to Middlesbrough, which is to do with old ironstone And mining. that's where the ironstone was being taken from here to the yes. steelworks in Middlesbrough, presumably. Yes, exactly. So let's get walking up the hill and we can learn more about the ironstone that used to be quarried here. Because that's inspired your project, hasn't it? It has, really. We'll see in a little while the um, old kilns, which are ruined now. And there's kind of these arches, which are amazing. And it's that building or the remains of it, and a couple of others that were my first inspiration for really loving this place. And what brought you here, Adam, in the first place? Well, the moors have been part of my life forever, part of my family's life. My mother talks about being driven over the moors to Rosedale by her dad, who, apart from being a very fine violinist, was also, um, in those days, selling fish. Uh, right. For his fish shop. So your granddad was a violinist as well? Yes, he was. So it's in the blood? It's in the blood, definitely. I have tried to get Adam to sell fish. <laughs> so, so far to no avail. But. And, I don't know, just about 20 years ago, Mum, who'd been living down south, wanted a house here. And so, more or less throughout Jessie's life, she's been coming here a great deal through the summers and winters and every other time. And that house is essentially just below some of the kilns. Right. Yes, I remember playing sort of not in the kilns, but around the kilns and feeling as though they were a kind of castle that I could possibly own. And yes. You made up the imaginary games yes, about them. exactly. And Murray, did they just drag you along here? Completely. Yeah. Um, no, we're passing a lot of chickens here. Yeah, Hang I'm on. There are some ducklings. There are some beautiful little ducklings here, aren't yeah. there, around this pond of water. <laughs> How gorgeous. <laughs> so, what are you saying? You, you yes, I have to admit, it. the first time I ever really got to know here was um, Adam and I were as part of a, a sort of a small orchestral thing doing one of those wonderful, I'm sure Adam will agree, wonderful New Year oh God. Viennese oh, concerts. Yes. I've forgotten about that. Yes, I thought you'd probably try to. So, you're doing this place. concert? So, we did this concert, and here was the logical place to come for one night's accommodation. And so we've arrived here in the dark, sit up drinking whiskey, chatting the way you do, and uh, then we get up the next morning 
and look out the window and suddenly I'm seeing this view with the arches and gorgeous hillsides and so on. So it was almost snuck up on me without Love knowing. Yeah. <laughs> well, t tell us a little bit about your about the Cider House Rebellion. First of all, what is the Cider House Rebellion? Well, <laughs> in some ways, it was a rebellion against the fact that all the new craft ales have got far too many hops in. Yes. And so we jumped ship from liking real ale and started drinking cider. When was this? <laughs> four or five four, years four, ago, yeah. probably. We, all, um, we both noticed that um, you'd go, you'd be, you'd be somewhere you didn't know, and you'd go to the pub and you'd say, uh, hey, what, what, have you got something dark? No. Oh. You got something multi? No. It would be this over citrus hoppy number that neither of us are particularly um, desirous of. <laughs> uh, in fact, I think the first time you uh, made me do the cider thing properly, we were playing at Glastonbury, and uh, Adam went and bought something really quite um, chewy in the cider department. And that was that, basically. Oh, right. It's been cider ever since. <laughs> <Yeah>. And that's <laughs> how you, why you named your duo. <laughs> it's, part, it's partly that, and partly what we're doing is, I don't know, it's a rebellion against, against being pigeonholed, against having to... Because what we're doing is a... It's not really folk music, although it's definitely folk music in the beginning, but folk music isn't people standing and just making a tune from nowhere for 15 minutes, which is what we do. You improvise all your music? Yeah. Yes. Right. Mostly. So, I mean, we do sometimes take a tune as a starting point. Yes, absolutely. But that's um, 30 seconds of the tune, which yes. yeah. becomes an eight. So a bit like a jazz uh, in improvisation. A sense, yeah. you, know, you might start with this tune that people recognise yeah. and then head off in all sorts of directions. Wherever yeah, it uh, takes us. certainly found probably due to lockdown because suddenly we couldn't play in the same house as each other even outside becomes the the logical safe space to go and play and then we're in beautiful countryside and it always evokes an emotion or a thought or a feeling and then we found that well the improvisation most definitely reflected where we happen to be standing. And so the so place, you suddenly influences, place the music. Is influencing the music, but wow. most definitely. Well, now this is perfect for folk on foot. That's like, <laughs> you are that is the point. in the sweet spot of folk on foot. <laughs> because, you know, of course, what we are about is taking musicians to landscapes that have inspired their music. But what we're going to have today is that you're taking us to a landscape where you're going to create some new music yep. yeah. that nobody's ever heard before. Correct. But in terms of the improvisational process, do you then end up with a piece of music that you can take somewhere else, or do you have to record it in situ in we'll order record to it in it? situ? Because quite often we'll get to the end and we won't remember what we've played. In a way, you have to capture the moment. Yes. Which is exactly about that, and it's unique. 
I love the idea that music can be absolutely created here and now and to actually get to a situation where that's what we can do. We can just stand and we'll make something. It's a real privilege to be able to do. Mm. Gentlemen, that was magnificent. Thank, <laughs> Thank you, you very much indeed. A unique piece of music specially created for folk on foot in the Rosedale Valley Absolutely. by Cider House Rebellion in the shadow of this beautiful ruined building. Do you, is the day important as well? I mean, if this oh, is yes. a sunny day, yeah, oh, totally. beautiful. Absolutely. So could we have been in a minor key if it was raining? If we wouldn't have been playing. If it <laughs> we wouldn't have been playing if it was raining. <laughs> but, but yeah, cold, absolutely. Wet, wind, uh, cold, windy. Yes. Yes. Then you would take a more sad, downbeat. Well, kind of yeah, music. because it, probably, although it can sometimes go the other way with windy. Windy can be quite. It can be very uh, dark energy, and and you can sort of feel sometimes up here in particular, when you've got that hard weather, you kind of connect a little bit more to the industry and the and the the energy that must have been here when everybody's working. That workers exactly, would have paid, yeah. and all the stuff they had to cope with. And if you imagine trying to eke your living doing 15 hour days and it's freezing cold and certainly we've heard stories of um you're working in the kilns and it is roasting hot you know you are absolutely in in the pits of hell and then you walk out into snow freezing cold weather i mean that that harshest of harshest environments to cope with so sometimes this feels so idyllic yeah. and gorgeous it is gorgeous today it's got that whole feeling of oh it's just beautiful anyway but also actually we've been up here recording over the last 12 months, 12 months and mm. certainly the last bit this year it's been cold and then it's been really cold and then it's been snowing and then it's been trying to rain on us and then it's snowed again <laughs> yes. and when you're playing in the snow that must affect the quality of the music doesn't it it must affect the, 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 the only if you the... fall over <laughs> <laughs> uh, no it does that's that's yeah. the whole point i mean yes, it's it it's, it's spirit of place that old concept but it's not it's not the stones it's the, it's the whole environment yeah, and how you are in it it's it would be stupid to pretend that we're playing something that's kind of true for the place in itself. It's only true for us in the in place moment, at that moment. At that moment. Yeah. And, and that's our connection to I mean, playing just then, absolutely at one moment, I just looked at the clouds and thought, isn't that gorgeous? And I know it affected what I played. And I it's, know it did. It's also something, it sounds very conscious, but actually the whole point of what we do is that it's completely unconscious. There's no, oh, how are we going to reflect oh, so this? Not. It's no. just, here's a fiddle. But when we, when we what started, did it do? And you, allow that, you allow that to channel through you. Yeah, yeah totally. So you're sort of opening yourself up to what's going on around Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. And then just spontaneously allowing it to come out. Yes, well, Absolutely. when we started yeah. that, the only decision that was taken was what key we'd start in. Right. I didn't even know what time signature he was going to play in. He oh, probably, nor did I. He probably <laughs> didn't. Either, Has that so. relationship, that sort of symbiotic relationship, built up over time? Did you start out by playing in a more traditional way? And yes, then we learning did. Learning from each it's other. It's we it's did, except what I would always go yes, back to. Yes, yes, yes. You we, I was playing a um, it was an Edith Piaf trio tour thingy, and um, Adam Depp for one gig. And in that show, apart from the obvious PF numbers, there were some sort of uh, Balmusette sort of duos between myself and the fiddler. I've never played with this man. And we played them on stage with such a sense of connection and freedom that we both walked off stage and went, we, we have to play something together. We just yeah. have to. M playing the violin... I'm a trained classical fiddler. I've played the big concertos. I've done all that stuff. But all I've ever really liked is, oh, it sounds like a violin, oh, lovely. And, and just stood there. So my mother had a standard thing that she would 
shout up from downstairs, oh, are you playing what you're meant to be playing? <laughs> and the answer was always, absolutely not, I'm just making something up. So for me, I've always just done that, but it's not a thing for most players. So when I first started working with Murray, we were doing this stuff, we were working on some ancient folk tunes and working out good arrangements, and it was great. But Yeah, we were recording an album, and we got to that right it's the last day we're going to get this finished, this album that's been taking months and months and months. And this mad, crazy fool decided, if we get it finished ahead of schedule, how about we just hit record and play something? Um, and half an hour later, we stopped. Yes. Said, Literally okay. 30 minutes without a pause. Uh, it, it was quite a, a realisation for me, because I'd never really done it like that before. Adam may have done... I've done improvs and you've taken a solo in a band and all that sort of stuff, but to actually say, OK, we're going to start, and that track starts with Adam on his own. And I had no idea what we were going to do. Was it a bit scary? Yes, except luckily it kind of happened before we had a chance to think, <laughs> oh, heck, what's going to happen? So we just did it. It was always there, ready to happen between us. The only thing that needed to change was for Murray not to think. And as yes. soon as he stopped thinking, then that music's just there to create, which is wonderful. Is it? Listen, let's walk on. Yes. Indeed. To explore here. There is, there is. Yes. I like the way that looks from here. Ooh. Yes, that ruin. I mean, I just, I just want to give a sense of the view, <laughs> because... Uh, it is quite spectacular. This panorama. We're standing on a on, on a hillside, looking down into the valley, and uh, there are some uh, farmhouses and cottages down in the bottom of the valley. And then on the other side, the hill goes up again. And there, in a way, you, you wish you were a painter when you look at a view like this, because you you want to do the green of the fields. You can see the clouds, the shadow of the clouds moving across the hill. You can see the the trees cascading down and and then the stone walls that divide up into the fields i mean it is quite breathtaking here adam isn't it it is it is absolutely beautiful and it becomes even more so actually just as we round this next corner because you yeah. see right up into the head of the dale there which is the highest point i think or one of the very highest points of the north york moors and it's certainly one of the most central so you're right in the heart of the moors by the time you're up there now, of course we are now walking on the road we are. So this we're is on the, the railway, railway line. itself. Yeah, because you can see the, the shape of it below our feet, can't you? And so the railway line went right round the edge of the, uh, uh, of the escarpment here. So the, the, the ground falls away very yeah, steeply very to steep. our left. It does. Looking directly in front of us, we, you can see right now to the head of the dale, this railway goes along using that brilliant Victorian engineering just to stay at the most tiny gradient all the way around the railway right round there and you can see if you look to the what you were describing on the other side just below the top of that hill you can see where it changes from heather moor to a bit of bracken just at the top of the bracken there is where the railway is then going around and it carries on right round to where that tree is over there which is at the the first kilns that were ever put up as part of this so this valley would have been a very different place, wouldn't it? And I, I imagine that the people who worked here were quite a tough bunch. Oh, people walked from all over the country, all over from Scotland, people came from Ireland. It was common for people just to be workers who walked from one horribly difficult manual labouring job to another. And this valley was full of those people, the people working down the mines, doing the smelting. It was, I think, probably a fairly grim existence. And the hard drinking after work and all that. Oh, kind of stuff. yeah, there are lots of stories about that. Um, but also how they were completely undervalued and under, underpaid. So obviously, you're working underground and the like. You're going to need candles to see what you're doing. But you have to buy those yourself out of your own. Out wages. of your wages from the company. <laughs> yes. Oh wow. <laughs> Equally true with the beer. Yeah. So the company ran controlled. the pubs and, and, uh, and made money that way as well. Yes, I don't even think it was pubs as such, but yes, basically. I think our way into this has been absolutely through the landscape and through the kind of evocative nature of the ruins. And that all started because I met an archaeologist right at the head of the dale at the old Navi camp. 
And he was absolutely charming and took us round the thing and explained it all. And I thought, right, we could do a project. Yeah. Get the history involved, find out the things about the history. So it's just a way of, I don't know, creating art from a different place. Jesse, how did the poems start? I, by then, had already written the poems for the first album, which we called Runian, which means whisper in Old English. And those were poems written from tiny pieces of information about medieval moments. So, for example, the harrying of the North, which was where William the Conqueror decided that he was going to quell the North's rebellion with some incredibly harsh and unpleasant measures. But then tiny things picked out from something like William of Newborough, who wrote these accounts about... <laughs> For example, a toad who was found in a quarry who had a gold chain round his neck. And then I've kind of woven them into poems with the landscape. So this is essentially a follow-on from that. I have the landscape here. I can see the history. It's much closer. There's so much more information than those tiny snippets. But instead of writing, you know, I could have written a poem which included every single piece of information, but I instead wove these folk elements in and let the landscape speak because it isn't just what was happening, it's kind of what it is now. Well, so. well hang on a second, because we've now arrived at these arches, which we should describe. These are mighty, they are. mighty construction here. The, the size of some of these blocks of stone yes. is enormous. And this is almost like a sort of a Greek temple or an Egyptian monument sticking out of the side of the hill because it's it's been uh, crumbling from the top isn't it it's yes. ruined at the top but the mighty archers still stride along the side of the hill here they do i think there are 13 of them in total as we get around that corner you see the whole span let's walk on and see remarkable so each of each of these is um a calcining kiln the ironstone was mined but it comes out with a load of stuff in it that they don't want and there's no use for steel making so it had to be heated and then you would get, it would get reduced down, you'd get a leftover stuff and then the much lighter stuff was put in the trains and taken round to Middlesbrough for its final proper smelting. And the way that they did it was they approached from the top and they had a horse and a, and a wagon attached to the back and these boys would be made to back their horse up and they had to unhitch the wagon at the last possible moment so that the wagon would tip and they would catch it and it would go in and the horse stayed on. Um, and I think the poem that we're going to do here is about the time that the horse didn't unclip and went down with it. Oh my goodness, so the, the horse got lost in the kiln? Yeah. Yes, you have to imagine, just I mean, you roasted. You see the top down to the bottom, now you can get the scale. Um, you have to imagine that all of that is filled with hot stone, an uh, absolute fiery pit. Um, am I correct in remembering these are the ones with the iron doors? Yes. yes. Yeah, so all this would be huge doors cut on the front from, from metal, big metal doors. They've now gone, of course. So you've got this massive, fiery inferno going on, and once the horse goes in, there's absolutely nothing anyone could do. Well, it sounds like a cue for a song to me. It is. <laughs> Memory sits on the raised eyebrows of ruins that curve past the hill's green wrinkled forehead. From where I stand I'm awkwardly haunted, trying to infer meaning but it's half disguised with the shuddering sighs of the playful wind. Something is stirring with my presence, a strangled story that can't quiet itself Someone is sitting by the bench, as though they don't believe in its purpose. A stubborn hat is entrenched in wrinkles, his face as weathered as these stones. The years on his shoulders smell heavy. The cloth containing them is worn, ready to be discarded. The impression of these arches has been strong on his spine. It's bent and pines for rest and so resigns its spent image easily. His grizzled jaw stirs at my gaze, shifting slowly to stare as I do and only the wind stutters our greetings. Q 
curiosities mingle in the space between us. My coat, embarrassed at its newness, blushes at his interrogation. The bench comments on the weather today, but I'm far away. A whisper of the past leads me astray. The kiln was hotter than these ruins remember, but this buckled man reminds them. Embers sit in the sockets as eyes, burning still though the fires have died. He will sit until this hill lies flat, until his hat yields to persuasion. Tell me, ghost, tell me what burns in place of your heart. Tell me the story that made you a part of this in-betweenness that ties your wizened frame to this space. Imagine, on the skyline, surely stands upright and proudly empty of warm breath, attesting to a triumph over death, an iron-clad horse born out of the land, the metal on his face so fine and grand, with his intricacies it's so obsessed. Eyelashes shine like spears pointed west, iron thickened skin, a beauty unplanned. Haunches, vast landscapes refusing to bend, hooves, metal dressed sunsets rusting onward, the strength of many men in your straight back. Iron vision, a tempest couldn't lend you movement. Like time, you will stand, and should you crumble with rust, the sky would turn black. He worked the mines as surely as I. Nostrils flaring with his breath, driven out with exertion, planetary eyes rolling with the wheels he has given his strength to. Roughened flesh pouring with sweat, like my forehead roaring red with the heat. Endless toil, aching toil does fret at our joints and accompany our feet. Strength loomed in his knees, always straining with the weight of men's greed. Their deep, selfish needs, dark coat shines red with the light, the fire's gift. He steps close to deposit his load, pleased with his service, and his ribs rise with breath, only to fall to his cruel, burning death. His back hoof slipped. The stone's grip sets him free, eyes roll, his panicked soul screams at his fate. So many hands reach his flailing mane, see the way it writhes, it anticipates pain. My hands reach out, but all of us, well, we fail. And the heavy limbs sprawl above his death, suspended in terror, he'll be burnt alive, flesh to ash in the hands of some god. Somewhere. This planetary stare condemned to fire and all should beware the greed of men. Their hot money-fed glee towers over the innocent and he burnt to ash. Yet my mind conjures him as an iron-clad horse. Standing proud he has lived in the embers of my eyes. Imagine on the skyline surely stands upright and proudly empty of warm breath, attesting to a triumph over death, an iron-clad horse born of the land, the metal on his face so fine and so grand. With his intricacies, it's so obsessed. Eyelashes shine like spears pointed west. Iron thickened skin, a beauty unplanned. Haunches, vast landscapes refusing to bend, hooves, metal-dressed sunsets rusting onward, the strength of many men in your straight back. Iron vision. A tempest couldn't lend you movement. Like time you will stand, and should you crumble with rust, the sky would turn black.
Well, now I'm really suffering from sensory overload because not only are you responding to the place and the history, but we're getting the drama of Jesse's poem that you're responding to as well. And the poem is telling us a story about the history and the place at the same time as we hear the music. That's about basically what we've just experienced, isn't That's, it? That's, I think, exactly yes. what we've just done. And the interesting thing about it is that you are listening to Jessie's words and improvising the music as she speaks. Is that right? Absolutely, yes. Right. How does that work for you? Well, I think the only difference between that and when we're just taking the place and the weather and stuff for ourselves is there is this completely other narrative going on. So you have to go further inside yourself, hear the words not respond to them in some kind of prosaic painterly way but just hope that it pulls an extra music and an extra kind of feeling and then you hear her the way she reads it changes depending on how we play and the whole thing cycles together cumulatively to hopefully create something that really functions so jesse you're affected by the music yes so i see it as another voice in conversation with mine and you can't just talk over somebody it's as though there's a another entity that is weaving in and out of my narrative and adding to and slightly changing the story with the way it's speaking i suppose it's a bit like a sort of hearing a film soundtrack being developed in real time you know so the the drama is unfolding and the, and the music is enhancing it just in the way that music enhances I think the film. What's, what's really intriguing though, Jesse's just said that the music is another voice having a conversation, and yet we are hearing her voice as another instrument. I like your analogy of the film soundtrack developed in real time. That's exactly exactly how it feels. And, and Jesse, are, are you really inspired by these stories of what went on here? I mean, what is it that, that you engage with, that you respond to when you hear the stories of the work that went on here and the hardship that was faced? For me, it starts with what exists here now. Um, I used to come up here so often when I was little that this was the landscape for me and I've only later sort of realised what it really was. So I've always made these small stories in my head, but now they're informed. And for so example, did you have stories about who might have lived here. Yes, did that you have kind of thing. Well, uh, in the next kilns, there are some holes which are, in fact, the goblin holes. Um, <laughs> they are to you anyway. Yes, they I are think to it's, me. It's a fact. I think it's a fact. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and then, obviously, the history is so—it's so present in the ruins. Even as you stand there, you can feel something. And so it feels almost not as though I'm creating, but tapping into something that already exists um, and just giving it the words it needs to express itself. What's interesting for me about a lot of Jesse's poems, both in this project and in the album we did previously, the Runian album, is she, she creates these things that she calls them folk tales, which they feel like ancient folk tales except for the fact that they're entirely new. <laughs> but are you, are you reading um, lots of ancient folk tales? I mean, you, I know you're a student at the moment, well, aren't you? What yes. are you studying? Um, so I study English and related literature, the related bit being important to me because I've just done a whole two terms of learning the Old Norse language and reading these old sagas and Eddic poems, which are the very... They're one of the seeds of all the folk tales we have because of the whole Viking culture and movement. And, and what effect does that have on you in, in terms of thinking about writing stories now? As I say, it doesn't feel as though I'm writing stories. It feels as if they already exist and I can pull them out, which is, of course, not true, except perhaps it is. Maybe the landscape is kind of whispering something to you which you don't know it is until you listen. I think it's interesting, I don't know if you agree, Murray, um, when she talks about being able to tap into these stories that feel as if they already exist. That's, I would say, completely analogous to our way of creating music. Um, I think it's analogous to the way humans interact with place. We all know when you go 
you go, go somewhere beautiful, it isn't just that you're looking at it and saying, oh, isn't that lovely? It gives you an emotional reaction, not just a visual reaction. And I think that is what this is all really about, is, is exploring that connection that we all have, but we don't necessarily really explore or talk to. Well, you're giving it a voice for me. You know what I mean? Because I'm here looking at these amazing surroundings and looking at the contrast between the industrial ruins and the beauty of nature. And I'm feeling emotions as a result mm. of that. But you have then given voice to it, which has massively enhanced my walk. <laughs> yeah, <I'd laughs> yeah. um, and, and again, it's very much what this podcast is, is all about, is understanding the interaction between art and landscape yes. and history and yes. natural history. That's what's fascinating us at the moment. And I'm talking we, of which, yes. What are we seeing now? Well, this, I think, always looks like an old Crusader castle from what? an entirely different part of Europe, <laughs> but it's not. Um, These are the, the new kilns, apparently. The ones we've just been at with the arches were judged to be not sufficiently effective, and they came up with this very different design. What? Oh. It's a mighty structure. Absolutely. Just jutting out. Of the side of the uh, of the hill. Age stirs in myself. Shoulders aching with the will to ruin. Half realized waking with a desire to shudder down into decay. Broken pieces, my graveyard, which stays half empty for I stand. These same rough shoulders once led a people. Now the sky settles her face upon these old stones simply to sleep. I wake, aching, and my blindness thus lives. For the hand that hurried my existence on forgot my face, a deliberate disguise. They wasted their time forgetting eyes, hollowing my being. Still I stare in my blindness. Run. 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 One step, two, three, four. Run. The girl half falls. Dirty knees, testament to the day before. Up the hill she spent her sleep, folding into the shape told in the tales of the banks that bristle with their own steepness and thistles that bend to defend a castle. For what else sits above her lowered brow and gently reclines as dew ruins her shoes? Decrepit with age, but nevertheless the very place she presides over with her child's tongue. One step. Two. Three. Four. Run, and she'll reach its cast-off stones and clamber up round the fence and wander to the battlements. Faded green, a sheep-clipped lawn, her loyalist subject, of course. This castle crowns her. Long hair flying, red jacket lining her invisible throne. Another child shakes the grey dew from where her body might have lain. She slumbers too suddenly these days it's dead, dangerous to dip below beyond the break of burning morning. Her flesh last walked longer ago than these battlements know when the valley blushed green with forest and smoke weaved its way up from the smaller fires. She had lost her way too young. Past the prattling, patient stream, settled softly singing in the woods, willing her to wonder where she is. But all too 
Late, she walked and grew interested in the birds that flew overhead. The hill she knew afforded a view, and she climbed and thought it safe and slipped and fell. To tell the truth, she felt nothing at all. But her neck snapped, and the small birds mourned the body. She wakes and knows the red coat, rushes forward to greet the queen of the castle, disrupting her sleep. Age awakens in me as they step onto my shoulders to see, stretched imaginations filling my hungry belly with knights and arrows and dressing me in their dreaming. They speak a silent kind of language, each one only convinced of the other by feeling. The queen's feet are light, but her companions are feathers, grey ghosts floating. They're strange monarchs, ordering the butterflies to do their bidding. Beastly, I sit, disguised as their castle, and. Do you like my red coat? The girl's voice echoes heavily and settles into the other's greyness. No answer, but the curl you crying, though she knows the answer is lying on a tongue that once existed and smiles at their silent agreement. The red coat suits their purpose. They holler. Wan's proclamation banishes the quiet from her kingdom, save for her silent friend, who holds tight to her hand. For the folds of her existence are wearing thin with use. Each day, truce is declared, as the tractors teach the sheep to shout back, and the girls' armies don't materialise on command. And the red coat rushes up and down, a panting red tongue gasping for air. So, to sustain their kingdom, my walls don't fall. Age becomes me, perhaps, with my reddening skin and joints long since immobilized. A tree grows from me. Life spun from my thick refusal to crumble. Onwards, I shall ache. They holler loud enough to scare away my blindness. Again, what really intrigues me is when Jesse talks about reading the Norse sagas. I wonder, Adam, if you're hearing music that, that you know, folk music from the past, or classical music, or are you feeling guided and influenced by things that you've learned before? I don't think there's anything specific that influences, except that a friend of mine calls it your habitus. That is my music, if you like. The 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 it does come from folk music and it comes from every piece of brilliant classical music I've played you know Stravinsky when he can create some kind of amazing soundscape I'm not suggesting that we're creating Stravinsky here but it's it's those things just well, they're all into, there they're in all your there. consciousness that, they, what you're hearing or is subconsciousness I suppose yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. subconsciousness and uh, and what is your musical history I mean did, did you start out young or? yeah no I um, uh, my grandpa was as I said a very fine violinist. I never really understood the difference between different kinds of music. I sort of, in a way, still don't. For me, it's music, it's sound, it's expression. I don't like the pigeonholes. What he taught me to do was play a violin. The thing that happens, interestingly, is if you decide you want to learn to play an instrument, you automatically, unless you're very much in a different circle, if you're you end up doing classical music, is what you're taught. You're taught grades. You're... So classical music became what playing a violin was, except for the fact that I always just left on my own, played my own stuff, and didn't bother practising the classical music I was meant to be. You know, I went off to music college, um, 
the concertos all over the place. Were yeah. you listening to folk? I mean, we, uh, yes, you have a that's, col- that's what I always albums. listened to. Yeah. Yes, essentially. Um, I mean, I, I used to listen to one night it would be Vaughan Williams symphonies and the next night it would be the Corries or someone. <laughs> so it, folk music has always been... It's music that is developed from people. It just comes out. It's, it's real and it's direct and it's immediate. So I've never understood... Also, the classical music I like best, Bartok, um, not, not all of it, but Bartok and um, Vaughan Williams, for example, that, but that's, both, that's folk music at the beginning, completely. Well, Vaughan Williams took the folk music and put it into the classical music, as didn't did, he? As did Bartok, yeah. um, and not alone. And, and what about you, uh, Murray? What's the story? Well, what, what, what makes a, a person take up the accordion? Um, some would say insanity, but uh, <laughs> uh, my parents... At, when I was a young boy, they were very much involved in the um, Scottish country dance sort of scene. So in my early years, I was very definitely exposed to Scottish country dance, and of course, that's likely to be accordions and fiddles. And so that, that would be the first exposure to the accordion. I started on recorder and piano, like most of us do. And when I got to, I think I was about seven or eight, my father decided, said, well, look, you've been... You've been doing the practice, you're doing all right on this, would you like to take up another instrument? And I've drawn up a list, and he had every instrument he could think of, all the orchestral classical thing, everything he could think of. And my short list got down to two instruments, and it was either the accordion or the bagpipes. Right. That was my short list. What a fork in the road that must have been. (laughs) Bit of a shock, I feel. Um, How did he respond to that? Went and bought an accordion. And found a teacher. It was a, a, lo- a lovely lady called um, Alice Swindles, who I'm afraid is no longer with us. But she was very much from the uh, 1930s. She was sort of a, a teenager in the 20s and 30s, doing when the accordion really was coming to its own in music hall and so on. So when she was teaching me in the uh, what would it be late 70s, she was towards the end of her of her life. And so she was the first to say, "Look, I don't know the modern thing. I don't, but." but I'll get you going. And so I started with that. Um, And then the BBC actually has uh, something to be blamed for on this one. They did a programme on Radio 4 called The History of the Accordion. Um, It was an hour-long programme, and it was hosted by Morgens Elegard from uh, Denmark. And he was the instigator of what we now call the free bass or the classical accordion. And I heard that and was just amazed to hear, wow, the accordion's doing this and it's doing concertos and it's doing, oh, wow, this is so exciting. And off I went down the classical route very strongly, ended up going to, uh, you know, the academy and doing all the classical thing. And then kind of found, yeah, I can do this. Something's not me. I can play it, but I go home and I'm not listening to it. And and then it sort of drifted back to, to folk and I got... I got really into sort of European um, stuff, French stuff, uh, and it just went from there. And uh, I had an interesting realisation maybe about uh, six months ago, because uh, I always think of myself as, oh, I'm a classically trained musician who's now doing folk, but I've actually worked out I've been playing professionally as a folk musician longer than I ever did classical. So, <laughs> and are I you happier now? I am much happier now. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Come into your skin. I'm in my, yeah, I found my voice. At your last. element, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that was the same for me, just to finally think, actually, I'm just going to do this stuff I love mm. and that I've always played, and let's get it on stage in a, in a well, not stage, in a field or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, yeah. But now if I play a violin concerto, I would play it in exactly the same way as you see me doing that, except hopefully not improvising as much. <laughs> <laughs> stick it to the, stick it stick to it the, the rocks. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where are we going? We're going up? We're going to yes, go we're going up a staggering path. We're effectively climbing up a sort of slag heap here, aren't we? Yes. I mean, isn't that well, what? Kind of half that and half. half. Yes. Uh, is yes, that... we are. Yeah, yeah, I think we basically are. <laughs> right, let's get Better. our breath back. <laughs> and Adam, what's this building here at the top? Uh, these are workers' cottages. Um, they're quite interesting. They, there'd been an act in Parliament forbidding the building of back-to-back houses, so they rather cleverly made them as an interlocking L shape which has exactly the same function of putting houses back to back as possible (laughs) and there's also these apparently were inhabited by two sets of people at the same time so the night shift worker would use the bed during the day 
and the day shift wor- the worker would use it during the night. How extraordinary. Yes, hot bunking. Hot bedding, I think. It was yeah, really hot bedding, I suppose, yes. Um, and they were, they were living right on top of the work here as absolutely. well. Absolutely. Because it's literally on top, because we can look down towards the kilns that we were at just a few minutes ago. And you can see how close the railway was to their bed. This that we're actually walking on now, that goes straight past it, is, was, literally, one of the tracks. So the trains would have kept running all night, presumably. Yeah, presumably. Uh, while they were trying to kip in these, uh, in these cottages on the left. And just behind us, um, beyond the cottages, these are, that's an old mine shaft going in. They were all destroyed at the end. So the, the, it's mining literally there. Something going on on that side, something going on, on that side. And apparently they also, you know, they had their little gardeny bit out the back there. It must have been. But they were trying to cul- cultivate things in that's the middle of all this. That's what he said, this. yes. That's a of the human spirit, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Thank you. 
So Murray, Adam and Jesse, it's just been amazing to experience your music in this extraordinary landscape and to hear your poetry. Thank you so much for taking part in Folk on Foot. It's been a Thank pleasure. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> and the rain's starting now, so it has a, it has. shall we head for home? I think that's a great idea. <laughs> <I think> so. <laughs> The Cider House Rebellion and Jesse Summerhays in Rosedale. If you've enjoyed this episode and you'd like to know more about the music and the poetry that they created, well, we've filmed it and we've added it to Folk on Foot on Film, which is our amazing archive of more than 100 songs and pieces of music that we recorded on our travels. It's only available to our patrons who give us £10 a month to help support the podcast. So if you'd like to support us, if you'd like to experience that wonderful archive, please go to folkonfoot.com and press on the Support Us button button simple to sign up and you'll get loads of wonderful rewards we love making folk on foot with your support we hope you can go on forever